It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the program. With me in the KFG studio is my business partner and fellow CFP, Josh Gregory. Hey, normally CD rates are low compared to what you can earn investing in a little bit more risky investments. But now that rates have risen significantly, are they a more appropriate component of your balanced portfolio? We're going to hit that question as well as listener questions on today's episode. Did, did you ever think you'd be here in your career? No. I, that we are even answering this question. Talking about CDs at all? As a possible investor. I, I mean, but yeah, we've it's a great question. We're going to be hitting that. Uh, if you have a question for the show, actually the entire show today as well as last week's all questions from fans of this show. We'd love to hear from you. You can call or text 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. Online, wisemoneyshow.com. And you can submit questions right there on the website. They come, turn into an email, come directly to me and get added to the question bank. We're going to hit several here in the next uh, hour. And then all over social media as well. Wherever you're at, we are there as well. Search the Wise Money Show. You can submit questions that way also. All right, so here we go. Great question from a great fan of the show, Daniel. Here's what he said. Ura, or is it Ura? Ura. Ura, Corhorn Financial. Big fan of the show. I never miss an episode at all. Currently serving in the USMC, uh, the Marine Corps. And I was wondering if you think investing in CDs are a good investment option right now. So, of course, we would want to thank you, Daniel, for your service, yeah. first and foremost. And Kevin's still under the weather. Otherwise, he certainly would as... Uh, as a vet himself and uh, two kids in ROTC that have been serving as well. So, Daniel, thank you. And all of you, thank you. Don't, don't you just love Daniel? Uh, just just hearing the fact I that know. he's actively serving right now. And, man, that that's great. I, I hope that you are not in harm's way, Daniel. I don't know where you are in the world, but uh, the fact that you're ready and willing to go serve, to go into harm's way on the behalf of all of us, wow, what a, what a great sacrifice. And... Uh, Thank you, Thank and, you and for your service, and not to not to put anyone down, but Marines. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> I mean that's that's it's bad. Tough, tough bunch. Huh? Grand, Grandpa was a Marine and and, uh, and and served in the war, and so. All right, the question, and and it may be a question that you've asked yourself. Wow, I can actually get a decent CD rate right now. Does this belong in my overall investment portfolio? Depending on when you're listening. And, and depending on how much you've you've looked, you might have seen some billboards. You might have just searched online. You might have um, talked to your financial advisor about this, CFP. And depending on that search, you might still think, oh, CDs are still paying around 1% or 2%. Or you might have been able to find some in the 4 to 5% range. Right now... So local banks, and we'll get to the you know regional banking crisis here in just a second, but local banks may offer a CD special, paying 45 or 5% for a one-year CD. Um, you don't need to get that special if you're looking at brokerage CDs or something like that through your financial advisor. Those are, that's sort of the competitive rate out there. But if you're just, if you've got blinders on and you just say, hey, I, I'm, I just need a CD, um, they're still probably only paying one or 2% at your local bank, but you can find a better interest rate out there. Isn't that interesting? Just the, the, I guess, diverse range of rates that you can find out there. Some are extremely competitive and others are pretty stingy on the interest rates. So not all CDs are created equal right now. And I think that sort of speaks to the, to me, the, the guts of the, the regional banking crisis. And that is when you put dollars in your checking account, your savings account, or even in a CD. The bank's not just going to sit on those dollars, put them in a vault that, you know, with your sticky note that has your name on it. They actually invest those dollars. And they're not, you know, shouldn't be speculative investments, you know, Bitcoin and all this, you know, crazy stuff. Instead, they're usually lending that money out as an investment. And they lend it to people for, you know, an auto loan or a mortgage or some sort of personal loan, business loan, something like that. And they earn an interest rate, say 7 8%. 
and then they pay you that allows them to pay their bills and all of that and then pay you the one or two or three or four percent well a lot of banks there weren't enough loans out there so they ended up loaning the money to the government and they don't do that through some back channel exchange they do that through bonds the government borrows money by issuing bonds and people loan money to the government by investing in those bonds and bank even though your cfp and certainly us here gosh when interest rates were at record lows we we were not trying to lock in those interest rates over for a long period of time you were investing in shorter term bonds or intermediate term bonds because you just knew well rates could go up at any time here and when rates go up i don't want to see my investment drop so quickly which we can touch on in just a second and i want to be able to reinvest those dollars into higher interest paying bonds well a lot of these banks invested in 20 or 30 year bonds locking in these crazy low interest rates mm -hmm. for a long time and then when people started drawing money out of their bank accounts they these banks then were forced to sell those investments at depressed prices at depressed prices right. and all of a sudden there was a run on the bank and i think that is the crux of the reason why many banks just they can't afford to pay five percent on every cd they just can't yeah it, their regular CDs are still at one or two percent because that's that's the cost structure. That's the structure they they uh, that they're operating under because of these loans that the, the bonds that they have in their in their portfolio. That's right. That's right. So, you know, to me, it's also interesting. There's, um, I guess, kind of a recent phenomenon that only happens every so often in history where those one year rates that you're talking about, maybe they're promotional rates upwards four or five percent. That's higher than what you might get on a five-year CD, for example. Oh, absolutely it is. So it's it's almost counterintuitive where normally you would expect, if I'm going to lock my money up for a longer period of time, I expect to get a higher interest rate because of it. I'm accepting more risk. Um, I, I want more of a reward for having to postpone the enjoyment of those dollars, that kind of thing. But here we are. We're in, in a situation um, it's a phenomenon called a yield curve inversion. Mm -hmm. That's some economic jargon if there ever was some, right? Uh, but it basically means things are flipped. They're, they're upside down right now. They're backwards. Shorter term interest rates are actually higher than the longer term interest rates. And that's actually not really a healthy thing. No. It's often a prediction that there may be troubled uh, waters ahead. And um, it, it's something where, okay, if you did take advantage of a one-year CD at 4 or 5%, it doesn't mean that when that thing comes due a year from now, you're going to be able to get that same rate necessarily. Right. It's, it's even predicting that interest rates may come down again in the future. That's yeah. essentially what that yield curve is, is communicating to us. Because if you can get a five-year CD, you might look and say, oh, for my bond investments, I would love for my bond investments to do that. So yeah, I'll just lock that up for 10 years. No, you can't. A 10-year CD, number one, it's going to be very hard to find. Uh, but mm -hmm. number two, it'd be two or 3%. So let's get back to the issue here, Daniel. I, so to me, if you are a long-term investor and investing mostly in growth oriented investments and, and, and should be for, you know, in that risk tolerance, I don't think it would be wise to take a chunk out of the stock market or your long-term investments, even though they performed probably, you know, disappointingly over the past 18 months, I don't think it'd be wise to take dollars out of there and throw them in CDs. Um, simply because yes, certainly could the market be volatile. You already mentioned Josh, that inverted yield curve typically has, been an indicator that there's challenging times ahead in the markets and the economy. But we just we just don't know. And therefore, to peel dollars out of long term growth oriented investments to to lock up and, and achieve a 5% rate of return over the next year, I probably wouldn't take that bet. In the short term, you might look and say, oh, my goodness, that was a fantastic idea. We just don't we just don't know the future. And I, so I wouldn't take long term dollars and reposition them to be short term just for the 5 percent interest rate. That's right. And you're basing that on the principle that your investments should match the goal and the time horizon that the money is being invested for. If, however, you know, you're close to retirement and you may be spending some of this money in the next two, three years, 
then yeah, being uh, more short term, safer with those investments, not subject subjecting it to the ups and the downs of the stock market can be appropriate. And all of a sudden, CDs could be a tool that would be worth considering maybe for the first time in a number of years. Really. I've built more CD ladders for clients in the past 12 months than I did in the previous 19 years of my career. Isn't that Just, crazy? Yeah. because but it, So if you're close to retirement or have some dollars that are short term, but you don't need them just yet, and they're more bond replacements or fixed income replacement, I think that is appropriate for CDs. There's one additional context, though, before you rush, rush out and replace your bonds with CDs. So we've got that and more coming up on The Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. What you're watching right now is our weekly one-hour talk show that airs right here on this channel, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, every Saturday morning, also on podcasts at the same time, but also on a couple local radio stations, which is why the content is structured the way that it is. But we've got a lot of other content. Odds are, if you've had a financial question, faced a financial circumstance that you've needed some help with, likely we've got some content about it, probably over a thousand videos here on uh, on the YouTube channel. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and if you like the content, like the content. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrea was at a uh, an event just the other day, and there was um, someone who was asking some financial questions. Kevin was there too. Ah. And uh, so Kevin was kind of fielding some of these questions, and Andrea chimed in with, Hey, you should go check out. You guys just did a show about this. It was a 529 plan ah. question. And so Andrea sent her the link. And then she was looking at all the work that Lindsay has done to basically, basically categorize all of the different videos and everything. And she was shocked by the, the volume. Yeah. But uh, she's well, listened to all of them. That's so. cool. That's very cool. Nice job, Lindsay. Thanks for organizing all that. Yeah. All right, so we'll go from Daniel to Edward real quick, but um, but there's a little bit more with Daniel, and it's going to get geeky. Oh boy, I'm just I'll I'm, I'm preparing. Be prepared to intervene. All right, <clears throat> you're working all your jargon in while Kevin's not here. You bet. You bet. <laughs> and planful. And planful. Planful. Yes. Okay. Do you replace your bond investments with CDs because the interest rates are so great? Well, right before we got back, I said it's about to get geeky. So I hope you are ready. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn out today. Uh, if you want to stay up to date on all Wise Money content or learn more about the show, learn more about the firm, you can find us online, wisemoneyshow.com. Submit questions there as well. And then all over social media, wherever you're at, we are there as well. Search the Wise Money Show. All right. Nothing but questions here today. The headliner question is one we're getting a lot and we've done a lot of work with clients on. And that is, is now a good time to be investing in CDs? And I shared earlier that, gosh, I've built more CD ladders. I'm going to explain what that is here in just a second for clients over the past 12 months than I have in the entirety of my career up until that point. And, and the CD ladders are essentially, well, we're for money that we're going to need in the, in 12 months from now, let's lock it up into a 12 month CD, a one year CD for the money that we'll need two years from now. Let's put it in a 24 month CD for money that we'll need three years from now. Let's use a 36 month CD. And prior to the regional banking crisis, depending on someone's retirement, if they were approaching retirement, their the personal pension plan, we were able to probably stretch that out to four or five years. But since the regional banking crisis, there have been fewer and fewer really attractive CDs at those two, three-year time periods. Right. So this has already changed a little bit with, uh, with the regional banking crisis. Plus, there's a little more risk. So mm -hmm. whether you are saying, yes, this applies to me, or no, it doesn't, if it does apply to you, you've got to manage your FDIC limits, and you've just got to know, like, I, guys, I just don't. I don't know. I don't th that that situation. The reason why we went the long road to explain the fundamentals of how the finances at a bank work and the challenges with the rise in interest rates and all that is is I, that essentially makes no bank immune from what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I, I just I don't know. We don't know what 
rates are going to do. We don't know what inflation is going to do. If rates have to continue to go up, more banks will feel that pressure, just like you as an investor, bond investor. So it's going to be tricky. That's right. But uh, Boy, I, I feel like the, the FDIC insurance conversation is one that we've had that conversation yeah. more in the past four or five months than you know, our entire careers combined. Yeah. Um, because it, it never really was a big issue. And that's, that's for a couple of guys who did live through the banking crisis, you know, back in 2008, 2009, um, where FDIC insurance was tested, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we had clients who had money in banks that failed and, uh, they were made whole on their FDIC insurance and everything, but it took time. It was an instant, but now all of a sudden, you know, making sure that if, if you're someone who has more than $250,000 in your bank account with one bank, then you may need to just take some precautions, yeah. you know? And, and you may say, boy, I wish I had that problem. Well, here's the reality. A lot of businesses have more than $250,000 just in cash reserves. They've got to be able to make payroll and, you know, pay for inventory and just keep the business functioning properly. But um, CDs at the bank uh, do provide FDIC insurance as long as you stay within the right limits. All right. Now, it's about to get geeky here because if you're looking, and Daniel, if you're looking at your bond investments and saying, gosh, I would, you know, last the, over the past 18 months, my bond investments are down 15%. If you look at that chart, oh, my goodness, it, it makes you queasy. And so you look and say, well, gosh, I should just replace these with CDs. I'm not going to talk you out of it. I would tell you to work with your CFP, but how bond works, specifically bond mutual funds, essentially you buy a bond, you invest in a bond. If you're buying it, you know, it's, it's issued at a hundred dollars and then it's going to pay a certain fixed interest rate for its entirety. And then when it matures, it will mature at a hundred dollars. And and it will, unless that company goes bankrupt and it, unless they default if, if it or matures at right? zero. I've explained this to so many people recently. They're like, yeah, but what if that company is struggling? You know, will it mature at 80? No, it won't. Even if they're struggling, it will mature at 100 unless they can't pay it. And if they can't pay it, it will mature at zero. They'll, it, they will be bankrupt. That company will go under. But it is issued at 100. It matures at 100. But along the way... If you were to buy or sell that bond, that price of that $100 original price and that maturing price is going to fluctuate based on, well, what is that bond paying in interest compared to what you can get out there in the prevailing market? And right now, so no, let me go back two years before interest rates really started to skyrocket. When you would look at those bond mutual funds and look under the hood, the average price of those bonds, maybe $104 105. So you knew there was four or five percent of overappreciation built in there because mm -hmm. interest rates had gone down so much. Now, and I can't tell you for this exact date, but now if you look at the bond mutual funds, um, maybe $91, $89. So you know that there is some future appreciation that is to come as well, in addition to the interest and yield that it's paying. Right. So therefore, you've just got to be aware of that really geeky thing before you just say, can all these bonds, I'm buying CDs. Yeah, and you might hear that and say, well, why in the world would anyone want to invest in bonds if if they're this sensitive to interest rates or you could lose all your money, that sort of thing? Hey, here's the reality. This is the only thing I would tweak in what you, you said. Um, if you hold the bond or if your mutual fund holds the bond all the way to maturity, it should get that full price back, yeah. right? But if they can't pay... Here's the beauty of being a bondholder. You stand in line before all stockholders, all owners of that company to get paid back when that company is liquidated. You'll, you'll most likely get some of those dollars back, usually. It, this is why the quality of the bonds that you invest in does matter. Um, are you lending money? Are you buying bonds from uh, really struggling companies? Or are you investing or purchasing bonds from the most rock solid, top of the heap, world class companies that should be able to pay, you know, their their bills on time fully, like clockwork. So Bed Bath and Beyond. I don't know if you were like our family and had a portfolio of these twenty percent off coupons. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, and you always ask, like it the coupon it said, you know, eligible for one item, and you always would ask, can I just use this on my whole cart? And they always said yes. 
Always because they didn't want to scan forty different right. coupons. Turns out they couldn't afford it. And if you bought the stock during the meme stock craze, because they were caught up in that, and you held it to bankruptcy, that stock is now worth zero. If you invested in a bond or or loaned them money via a bond, then that bond isn't going to mature at 100. It's going to mature at zero. But you'll stand in line before those stockholders to receive some, some sort of payment. Hopefully, right. it doesn't get to that. But there again, that's why we use diversification, right? So, um, so. Should you consider uh, CDs as part of your uh, balanced portfolio? Yeah, I think so, depending on your time horizon and depending on how much risk and where you take dollars from to rebalance into CDs. Work with your certified financial planner on that. Thank you, Daniel, for your service, for your question. Sorry for the long tangent-driven answer, but there you have it. All right, next question comes from fan of the show, Edward. Here's what he said. I'm 85 years old. Spouse is 82. I have our IRAs in two different investment firms. This year, did my taxes in TurboTax. This required me to take my RMD from four different sources. My, sp my accounts, my spouse's accounts, we each have two. Due to illness, I overlooked one of my spouse's RMDs, and I only took uh, funds from one of her IRAs. My question is, will the IRS hit me with a 50% penalty on the delinquent account? I noted this on my tax form. Is there any way that I can appeal it? And uh, we, can we can hardly afford this situation and just sort of a senior mishap. What, what a opinion. stressful realization. Yeah. I, boy, I've met people, you know, for the very first time, they talk about an, an old IRA and they haven't been pulling money out of it. They, they just didn't realize how the rules worked and all that. And when you explain required minimum distributions say that, you know, when you, when you uh, get old enough, the government forces you to start pulling money out of, out of your accounts because they want to tax you along the way. And if you fail to... The rules have historically said 50% penalty on the amount that you were supposed to pull out but didn't pull out. And you then have to pay the tax because you got to pull that money out and report it on your tax right. return. Yeah, that, that's a bad day yeah. when, when you realize that. Thankfully, the rules are changing starting here in 2023. If you uh, miss some required minimum distributions, it's now only a 25% penalty. Yeah. And it can be even lower, 10%, if you get... It corrected within a couple of years. But unfortunately, we're uh, hearing this question as a question from 2022. So the 50% penalty would apply unless you're able to get an exception or, um, you know, basically get some relief from the IRS on this one. Which we, I want to talk about that a little bit. Not that there's any promises, but want to speak to that. And then also want to talk a little bit about the structural issues here, depending on if you're in the same situation as Edward. So we've got that more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right. So can hardly afford the burden. Yeah. And have four different accounts. I wonder if those should be two different accounts. So I think potentially but merging. treated as two different accounts too. And then speak, IRAs. And then speaking to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can kind of tag team on that. So I think both of those as well as, you know, yes, you can appeal. Uh-huh. Um, so. You want to talk to the appeal part then? I can. Okay. Yep. Do you know what form it is? No. Google it. <laughs> There's an IRS form for everything. Yeah. How many clients do you have that have their required minimum distribution set up automatically? A lot of the banks or credit unions will do that. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't. It's not a high percentage, maybe 25%. It's, I mean, it's a great safety net, but it's, kind of annoying because it doesn't doesn't let you be as planful mm -hmm. uh, in how you take your required minimum distributions. All right. So you, the appeal is going to be made with a letter of explanation or letter of instruction that you attach to, to form 5329, basically saying I missed an RMD. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Does AI read your letter? Yeah, probably. You should right. have AI write your letter. I know. <laughs> All right, here we go. We'll get into that, and then Thomas's question, and then we'll go up to the YouTube question. So, All right, third segment.
What happens if you miss a required minimum distribution? What's the penalty? Has that changed? And can you appeal it? We're helping with that and more right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Joshua Gregory. Stay up to date on all Wise Money content. Find us online. But then also, if you've missed this episode or any others, go to the YouTube channel. Check it out. Search the Wise Money Show. Subscribe to it there. Turn on notifications. And so you're made aware every time we drop new content, you can leave questions there as well. Have a question coming up that was left on the YouTube channel just recently. So right now we're in the midst of Edward's question, 85 years old, spouse is 82. They each have two different IRAs at two different investment companies. And he forgot due to an, an illness that he was dealing with last year to take one of the required minimum distributions now potentially facing the penalty and asked how that would work. So thankfully there are, that rule is changing. It has traditionally been a 50% penalty. And starting this year, 2023, it's dropping to a 25% penalty. The challenge is in Edward's situation is that applies starting in 2023. And this was a 2022 missed required minimum distribution. In the future, with these new rules, thanks to the Secure Act 2.0, if you if you correct the issue in a timely manner, which I'm assuming is within the year, years, a couple years, yeah. then instead of a 25% penalty, it's a 10 year uh, or 10% penalty. Here's what this all speaks to. This is not from Mike Bernard, from Corhorn Finance Group, from Wise Money. This is just sort of industry kind of speak. The IRS has been a little bit more lenient in, in offering some exceptions two folks if you've only missed one of these and that's not from me that's from a cpa expert um that i don't even know personally but publishes a lot of uh, of information out there and does a lot of tax planning and whatnot and um therefore i i wouldn't give you false hope edward but i would encourage you to go through an appeal process or at least ask the irs if they will give you an exception here yeah and and i think the simple fact that in the Secure Act 2.0, they wrote some measures in to make this less penalizing. I think there's some sympathies here. Right, so right. what's that process like? I'm going to tell you to work with your CFP and your CPA. Okay, You said you did taxes on TurboTax. You might want to consult with someone because I think the form, let me just pull it up. The form to, to document your missed RMD is form 5329. I think you just write a letter explaining, never done this before, had an illness, blah, blah, blah and see if they will grant you the exception, mm -hmm. right? So Yeah, I mean, if if his wife is 82, I mean, she's been pulling money out of this IRA for over a decade. Yeah, And if years. you've got a great track record of never missing and always being, um, you know, fully within the, the spirit and the letter of the law, and you missed it and you have a great explanation, boy, you, you sure hope that there's a human being at the other uh, and the, uh, at the other mailbox, receiving your letter and going to read, you know, your your explanation or whatever. But uh, here's one other thing to keep in mind: you mentioned that there are four IRAs in total, two for Edward, two for his wife. He only pulled required minimum distributions out of three of them. What we don't know is, did he pull the exact amount of calculation out of each of them, or did he round up in some way? Did he take extra out of one of the the IRAs. Because here's the thing, you and your spouse each have a calculation that is done where you actually consolidate all of your IRA values and then apply a multiplier to come up with this required minimum distribution amount. It changes every single year because the multiplier changes every year and the amount in your IRA changes over time. So this is a new calculation fresh every year. But it's it's all the IRAs combined. You don't have to actually pull all of the required minimum distributions uh, or the appropriate amount out of each IRA, you could take it all out of yours and all out of your spouse's as long as uh, each spouse is covering their own required minimum distribution. I had recently a, uh, an individual who reached out and said, I took more than enough out of mine, therefore I don't need to take anything out of my spouse's. I said, no, no that's, that's, unfortunately. That's, not, that's not true. Um, but if you have two different IRAs, then you can take all of it out of just one of your IRAs, not two. If you have an old 401k, now you can't you can't 
you know, commingle that with your IRA. That's got to be separate. If you've got multiple old 401ks, you can merge them together. My understanding, 403Bs, you can't merge together. So it gets more complicated the more accounts you have in the various types, which to me at 85 and 82, I, it's, it's I don't to simplify. Right? I, yeah, I don't want comp. I don't want complexity because I even wonder, well, do you still need an account at each investment firm or could you consolidate and make things easier? Because I would imagine m- consolidating that would just trigger your memory. Uh, yep, we've got to take this one and this one. Right. Right. One for each spouse. Each spouse has to satisfy their own required minimum distribution. They happen to be different ages, so their calculation is going to be different because it's a different multiplier. Yeah. Um, so I keep in mind also, um, I, I, I think as people get deeper and deeper into retirement, they also start thinking more and more about their kids and what's going to be left behind, you know, how, how many IRAs or different accounts scattered across the countryside are your beneficiaries going to need to try to sort through or make sense of and then deal with all the paperwork if you were to pass away? Um, consolidating and simplifying is not just good for you. It may also be helpful for the family that stands ready to either help you during your lifetime or receive any leftover dollars when you pass away someday. Yep. I would hope, Edward, that you're doing some tax planning as well. I'm thinking of qualified charitable distributions. I'm thinking of doing Roth conversions above and beyond this. I remember having a client recently where um, the IRA for the spouse was just 10 grand. And so we had to take a couple hundred dollars RMD every year. And we took a look and said, well, you don't need this money. It's not a large amount. What if we just converted all of this to a Roth IRA? Would that put you in a higher tax bracket? No. Does it make sense? Yeah, it sort of does. And we just did that. So make sure you're doing that proactive tax planning. Too. I mean, it, yeah, it all speaks to why it's so important to have a certified financial planner in your life, exploring those types of strategies, but also uh, it's an extra set of eyes to help make sure that you don't miss this in the future. Um, you know, that that's one of the things that we sort of take on our shoulders as a responsibility here at Corhorn Financial Group. We've got entire processes, all kinds of systems in place to help make sure that our clients don't miss their required minimum distributions. That's right. Next question uh, was posted on the Facebook channel from Thomas. My wife was laid off recently. She has a simple IRA and would like to know if she can just leave it there at her former employer or does she have to roll it over? Now, Interestingly enough, he added in here, the account is three and a half years old. And that's interesting because simple IRAs have a very not so simple rule. And that is when you have the account open, you there is a penalty if you, if you close the account, if you transfer the money out of the account within two years. Why do simple IRAs, uh, simple IRAs have that rule? No idea. <laughs> it's not simple. That has driven me crazy my entire career. Because so often, as people have come in and asked the same question, Thomas, we always have to, oh, wait, when did you open the account? Or how long have you had the account? And uh, it needs to be open for at least two years. So you're past that threshold. Okay. The other thing that might play into this is how much money is in the account. And I don't have I don't know if there's a simple IRA guideline or if it depends on the company, but oftentimes accounts that are less than a thousand dollars will automatically get cashed out. And sometimes accounts less than five grand, they're gonna force you to roll over. Now let me say that differently because I I or let me say that again because I said that intentionally. The it a lot of times accounts less than a thousand dollars, they will just send you a check. And you've got to roll that money into another IRA or just cash the check and know it's going to be taxable, maybe penalized. Okay. If it's less than five grand, they're going to basically say, you've got to take this out. You can draw it out yourself or you can roll it to it or transfer it to an IRA, but the money can't stay here. If it's over five grand, typically they'll let you leave it there. The question then is, should you, or would it make more sense to combine it? into an IRA where you've got more investment flexibility, uh, you would avoid some of these RMD issues that Edward was talking about later in life, some of that complexity. So, The the only other procedural detail to pay attention to is if someone did cut you a check and, you know, for that smaller account, $1,000 or whatever, you may be tempted to just, you know, pocket it, go spend it, throw it in a bank account, whatever. Um, But keep in mind, uh, if you're inside of that two years, 
could be a 25% penalty. If you're outside of that two years, but you're under age 59 and a half, there could be still a 10% penalty for you. And you have up to 60 days from the time that you receive that check in the mail to get it back into an IRA and just completely wash clean or negate the entire taxable event, avoid all the penalties and everything. There's a tax planning strategy with this as well. So we're going to hit that more coming up on The Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Okay. Um, I could not find the question. Oh, really? I was searching. I'm like, where do you have like extra questions in your own bank there or what? But no. All I'm right. glad you said his name again. So we'll go from this one up to the YouTube one. And we'll see. This is four segments, so we'll probably have one more that we'll hit. We'll see. All right. <clears throat> Sounds good. Okay. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFC Studios, Josh Gregory. If you listen to podcasts, good news, every episode of The Wise Money Show, all previous shows as well, is on podcast wherever you listen. Just go there, search The Wise Money Show, subscribe to it, and rate the program there. We appreciate it. All right, nothing but questions from fans of the show, and uh, we're into one right now from Thomas. Wife was laid off recently, has a simple IRA. She wanted to know if she could leave it at her existing employer or or former employer or if she had to roll it over. There is a, in addition to answering the question, which we've, which we've done, there's a planning consideration here as well. They're just now starting a simple Roth IRA, but it hasn't been in existence in the past. And this has been, other than some of the rules not being as simple, we love the simple <laughs> IRA. It, for a small business, it's a great way to get a retirement plan efficiently set up for your team. Now, thanks to Secure Act 2.0, all the tax credits for doing 401ks, it's hard to imagine simple IRAs are going to be as attractive in the future, but we've liked them. The big challenge has been it was only pre-tax contributions. There was no Roth simple. Well, they're making that change, so we'll see. That's here's been the, slow and coming, too. It has. It, it has. So here's the thing, Thomas. It's painful that your wife is now laid off. Financially, that's painful. And and uh, our heart goes out to you. We've s- helped and served a lot of people in similar situations, right? Um, but if we can be opportunistic or help you be opportunistic at a challenging time, that may mean, depending on how long she goes unemployed, that may mean that you're in a lower tax bracket this year than in the future. This may, and I'm trusting that it will, turn out to be a blessing where she'll be leaving this employer, find a right, better fit, better company, better role, and have more income in, out there in the future. But you ask the question, does she have to roll it over? You may want to, because then once it's rolled over to an IRA, you could do a Roth conversion and basically voluntarily, voluntarily say, yeah, I'm willing to pay tax on this money this year while our income's lower so that I'll never have to pay tax on this money again in all the future growth. Mm -hmm. If you did that, you've got to be aware of the tax consequences and have some withholding for it, but it might be a year to consider simply because it sounds like there's going to be, it's going to be a different tax year anyway. Yeah. And this is a strategy that applies to people, not just with a simple IRA, like Thomas's wife, but if you just left an employer and you had a 401k, you may want to roll that over into an IRA because it gives you all that flexibility that you were just talking about, Mike, uh, with being able to convert money from an IRA to a Roth very easily. Not to mention just the simple fact that IRAs, you have the whole world to choose from as far as investment options. Mm -hmm. Inside that simple IRA where the money's parked right now, you know, you, you have, maybe it's a laundry list of options, but it's probably not more than a dozen, maybe two in a really liberal, uh, really uh, loose and flexible plan. Uh, but inside of IRAs, I mean, you, you have everything to choose from for the most part. And uh, that flexibility may just put you in a position to structure those investments even better for retirement. Yeah. All right. Now, speaking of the Roth, next question here uh, from Anonymous on the YouTube channel posted a few months ago, did a video so if you're if you're just if you just digest the Wise Money Talk Show here's uh, that airs on Saturdays, we actually have 
uh, videos that air on the YouTube channel every single workday. So there's a lot of content there, uh, you know, spanning the entire spectrum of financial issues and concepts. So make sure you go check that out. Did a video a few months ago about should you contribute to the Roth or do Roth conversions if you're in the 22% tax bracket? And individuals uh, submitted a question saying, hey, we're in the 24% tax bracket. Are you saying that we should be doing pre-tax right now because we're still all in Roth? We're doing our 401ks, our Roth. We're doing backdoor Roths. We're doing mega backdoor Roth. What do you think? Josh, what are your thoughts? Is the is the 22% okay, the threshold that anything at 22 and below you should be doing Roth, but 24 and above you should be doing pre-tax? Or how would you answer this question or go about answering it? Man, I, I used to be maybe a, a lot more simplistic in my approach to recommending Roth IRAs. I, I would previously say, you know, the lowest two tax brackets, it should be almost a no-brainer. Yeah. If you have a traditional 401k and a Roth 401k at work, use the Roth if you're in the lowest two tax brackets at whatever time period, um, you know, whatever brackets are prevailing at that time. But I, I have started saying, no, you know, maybe 22%, which is the third bracket, maybe the 24%, which is the fourth bracket under current tax law and everything. To me, it's, it's still the age old question. Do you believe that by paying the taxes now and then investing into the Roth IRA with already tax money, letting it grow tax free and being able to access it down the road and not care about what tax bracket you're in? If that's your situation, where you even maybe anticipate that your tax bracket might be higher out there in the future than what you'd be paying right now, then yeah, why stop at the 24% bracket? Mm -hmm. I, I have clients who they'll fund a Roth IRA um, you know, in the highest tax brackets. Yep. And why would you do that? Partially because of the belief that eventually tax rates are going to go higher again that today's rates are, even in the higher brackets, they're still lower than what they have been historically and probably still lower than what we may see in the future. And so by that definition or by that standard or approach, you would say, well, now is still kind of a bargain to pay the taxes now and avoid them in the future. That's what a Roth is all about. Yeah. Uh, the other idea is that there could be new taxes created out there in the future. It's wildly unpopular to raise tax rates. And yet introducing new taxes is something that the IRS has been doing for 80 years. And, uh, and, and hopefully the Roth would remain sheltered from those or it, it, it traditionally has been. So therefore, I completely agree, Josh. I, w I'm helping folks right now that we're voluntarily paying tax in the 24% tax bracket via doing Roth and Roth conversions and backdoor Roths and all that, even though we're in the 24% bracket. I would say I'm a little more, the, the next threshold, so going from 22 to 24, that's just a 2% tax rate increase. If tax rates sunset, the, the third tier is going to be 25%. So even the fourth tier right now, 24, is slightly lower than the 25. Right. So to me, I wouldn't take that um, my that video that I did about the 22% bracket saying, well, in the 24, you're wrong to be doing Roth. I I, I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't draw that conclusion. But past the 24% is the 32%, and that's an 8% increase, yep. and that's uh, that one's harder to to sure. to to swallow. I, I agree. So. Hey, there's one more scenario that's maybe kind of a somber one to talk about. Um, if you're in a higher tax bracket today, maybe that 24% bracket, um, but one spouse is sick mm -hmm. or you know, maybe has received some sort of diagnosis that would make you believe, hey, th this spouse is less likely to make it to a full life expectancy. If that's the case, then paying taxes in the 24% bracket may make sense just because you're also positioning that surviving spouse, that widow or widower, um, to be in a better tax position after you're gone as well. Because keep in mind, a married couple can have twice as much income 
before they creep into higher tax brackets as a single individual or a grieving spouse, Mm -hmm. right? In other words, your spouse doesn't need as much income to find him or herself in a higher tax bracket just because of, you know, going from a married couple down to, to single. So keep, keep that in mind as well. It's another reason to recognize maybe you together are never going to be in a higher tax bracket out in the future, but uh, one of you might by yourself. And then the last thing that I'd bring up here, and I, I think we already mentioned it a little bit earlier, but if you're in this, in, in this situation, you're maxing your Roth 401k, you're doing backdoor Roths, you're even doing mega backdoor Roth, it's likely you're shoveling a ton of money into your investment accounts, and it's possible you'll have more dollars in your investments than you'll need in your lifetime. And therefore, advantage Roth IRA as well, because the new inheritance rules through the Secure Act 1.0, making it a your non-spouse beneficiaries would need to withdraw the entire account within 10 years. It dollars in a Roth IRA, yes, they'd still have to draw them out within 10 years, but it would be at no tax consequence to them. So again, advantage Roth. So great, great questions. All right. I hope that helps you work with your certified financial planner. On behalf of Josh Gregory, myself, all of us at Corhorn Financial Group, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.